here are the, the arguments that I typically um, hear. So I'll, I'll hear someone say, well, you know, our genes are virtually identical to those of our Paleolithic ancestors. So, you know, we should be eating the same diet that they have, that they were eating. Now, that's correct. Uh, it also happens that our genes are virtually identical to those of a chimp. Right. What makes the difference between a human being and a chimp has more to do with epigenetics than it has to do, and that, by that I mean gene expression, than it has to do with the genetic code itself. And what's interesting is that changes in gene expression lead to adaptation. And it is, it would be pure foley to assume that we are epigenetically identical to our hunter-gatherer ancestors, <clears throat> given the changes in food and environment that have occurred since the Paleolithic era. So just because our genes are identical does not mean that we should have the same diet. That, that is not a legit argument. That takes care of that one. The, the second one, there's three of them. The second one, our ancestors and modern ha uh, hunter-gatherers consumed a diet that was mostly devoid of grains, legumes, and dairy. And our ancestors and modern hunter-gatherers were virtually free of disease of civilization. So that must mean that if we consume the same diet, then we're also going to be free of the disease of civilization. The problem with that argument is that it is an observation. You know, I see X and I, and I see Y. But that does not tell you that X causes Y. There can be other variables that you are not observing that observe that effect. Those people, those modern hunter-gatherers are in a completely different environment. They were subject to different types of stresses. Uh, maybe they were outside more. They got more vitamin D. You know, there's just a ton of reasons why that could be the case. So that is, it, it's an invalid reference. It's actually a logical fallacy right. to assume that. So, uh, Correlation does not equal causation, and an observation only gives you a correlation. So you cannot establish cause and effect based on that alone. So that's an invalid inference. Uh, again, you know, the analogy that I like to use there is the ice cream analogy that you might have heard before. But, uh, you know, every year as uh, ice cream sales increase, deaths by drowning increase. So is it that people ate too much ice cream and then went in the pool and drowned? <laughs> Did the ice cream sales really cause the drownings? Or if the other variable is that, well, the temperatures increase. So because it's warmer, people eat more ice cream. And because it's warmer, people go swimming more often. And hence, there's more deaths by drowning. Yeah. And so you see that... The see, it's interesting. When you make those kinds of logical, what appear to be very logical correlations that make no sense whatsoever, people are very apt to say, oh, right. But for yep. some reason... And, 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 you know, to some extent, I, I've been subject to this as well. I mean, I, I, the, it, partly because the, the, the paleo way of eating kind of sits well with, with me personally. But when you say something like, eating like this is really good for you, and, and you know, Bob lost weight, and so-and-so got cured of their autoimmune disorder, then it's true. So, so <laughs> I, why, why do you think it is that, that, I mean, do you think it's just that we're so fat? Like, who cares about people drowning and eating ice cream, but we're super conscientious about our, our waistline and, our, and our, what we put in our, our mouths? Well, you know, at least when someone is offering anecdotal evidence, it, there's a, something personal there. You know, you, can, you feel a little bit closer to it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. You probably know from a, psycho, a psychology standpoint, as opposed to some abstract observation or correlation. Right. So I... I'm not surprised that people feel like that's somehow more legitimate, but unfortunately, anecdotal evidence is the worst type of evidence that, that you can have, you right. know, maybe even worse than a correlation. Uh, and there is no amount of N equals one that will amass to an actual scientific experiment right. that count for data. They're all N equals one. They're, they're not clinical trials. Right. Wow. So what's the third one that you go after? So the, the third one that I like is, uh, you know, we evolved over millions of years without consuming the foods that became readily available only after the advent of agriculture. So we're not adapted to them. So we shouldn't eat them. And, you know, first and foremost, we evolved, we evolved over a million years. That's a royal we. That's like, um, yeah, okay, but, you know, we weren't human beings throughout that entire uh, period of time. Uh, but then just because a species has never consumed a particular food doesn't mean it's not adapted to it. doesn't mean that it won't tolerate it. Uh, 
And there are plenty of examples throughout evolution where a species finds a new source of food and thrives on it. Yeah. And you could argue that human beings are exactly that. You know, at some point our ancestors were hanging from the trees, eating mostly fruits. They came down to the savanna and started eating bone marrow from scavenged car carcasses. And that allowed them to have smaller guts and bigger brains. And then they discovered cooking, which had an even bigger impact or just as big an impact. And then eventually became some of the, the most feared hunters on the planet and extincted the, the megafauna. Right. Um, but, you know, we did not used to eat meat or very little of it. it. It doesn't mean that we weren't adapted to it. And there are other examples like that in, uh, in the literature. So just because you've never eaten it doesn't mean you're not adapted to it. Maybe it means that you're less likely to be adapted to it, but I'm still uncomfortable with that statement, you know? So when I, when I take a look at, at everything and I, I say, okay, if I want to use the evolutionary approach, what's the best way to phrase it? such that there's no such conflict, you know, I'm not falling into those traps. And that's the phrase that I offered, you know, almost at the end of my talk where I say, listen, there's been insufficient time and insufficient evolutionary pressure for complete adaptation to seed consumption to arise in Homo sapiens. And as a result, individuals that tolerate grains and legumes should be considered the minority and not the majority. So instead of saying, we're not adapted to them, you're saying, well, listen, there just hasn't been enough time for full adaptation to occur. So right. you're acknowledging the fact that some people tolerate this better than others, and maybe even motivating some people to think, hey, where do I stand on that spectrum? I, and I wonder, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'll run the experiment just to see where I, what I can tolerate and what I can't tolerate. And keep in mind, there's a lot. When I say seeds, I mean grains, legumes, edible seeds like sunflower seeds, and nuts. So there's a lot of stuff there that you, can, uh, that you might not tolerate. So you might consider the paleo diet a blunt tool in that it eliminates all of those. But then realistically, if you start looking at, say, the fact that grain agriculture isn't sustainable, uh, the fact that grains are poorly nutritious relative to vegetables and even meat, there isn't that much of a good reason to justify the consumption of grains. 